It's a big microphone. Okay, testing, testing, one, two, three, four. Yeah, look at us go. Give you a welcome screen, why not? There you go. How's about that for a welcome screen? Welcome, QT, Vulcan, GFX. Does it work? No idea. We're going to find out now. <laughs> on, what are we actually on? Um, programming games, I guess. Uh, it's a club where you can ask the questions. We can look at different systems. Uh, we looked at... Um, oh, that didn't work. Let's see, click on there first, maybe. Yeah, that's okay. That works now. Okay, that's the system that we're looking at, which you can't see because I'm monitoring my temperatures. Okay. Let's stop that from happening. There we go. And we're back. There we go. This is C++ entry point. And using Qt, we've been able to um, set up an instance of Vulkan. We haven't done anything with it. We just set up an instance. And I was working more on the um, UI layer of Qt rather than anything else. Mm, should I keep this? No. Oh, who's got a doobly on my phone? Oh, I'm not live. Mobile dashboard. Yeah, okay. You be a mobile dashboard by yourself over there in the corner. Good phone. Good phone. I'm going to have to name this phone. How's about Gippy? Right. <clears throat> We've named our phone. <laughs> Success already. Um, what do we have? It's on a different machine. It's on Linux at the moment. So let's look at our C directory. Twitch. What do we got? Nothing. Okay. Let's see what we can do with that then, shall we? I think it might be on GitHub. Uh, here we go. That's Rana. Um, I would like uh, the development side because I haven't agreed that this is good enough to go out yet. Last night I woke up at three o'clock in the morning with nothing to do. <laughs> well, this morning I woke up at three o'clock with nothing to do, so I did pass two on the UI. And I want to see if it works. So welcome to my viewers. Hello there. I've noticed you've crept on. If you want to ask questions, bring along your own code, ask me to look at your code, help you out with your projects, very happy to do so. Very happy to do so. Uh, the code. I'll take a copy of you. Qt Creator. <laughs> Just open this thing up. Yeah, I've got my whole computer now working at 30 degrees C whilst we're at 17 degrees C outside, so I'm pretty happy about that. New mm, Git clone. Okay, repository paste. C Twitch, Rana, recursive. Yeah, that'll do. Succeeded. Okay. That's fine. Let's just open something then. Uh, what should we open? I've only got these two. Where did the other thing go? Hmm. Hmm, there's something missing here, isn't there? Let's have a look at this. Oh, it says main. Uh, 
that's not good to me. Uh, tools, get. <laughs> Manage remotes. Origin. Hmm. It's not going to help me. Does this work, by the way? No rule to make target. What? Interesting. With 32G++, yeah, we've got that in. Default rules for deployment. <sighs> we've got all the Win32 stuff and Unix stuff in here. Pre-target depths. Oh, of course, yeah. We have to build midnight, don't we? Configure project. <laughs> I just realized midnight is the actual... Um, I just build. Alright, that's working alright. You have to build this first. This is the um, static library that this runs off. So I'll just run it now. Let's have a look at this compilation. <laughs> no rule to make. Build. <laughs> Needed by. Stop. I'm not asking you to build that. This is typical of Windows. I don't want you to make that, you dodo. Why is the build? Not quite there. Hmm. Is these supposed to be different? Bada boom, bada boom, bada boom, bada do. No idea. Is the answer? Really don't care that much. It looks like you have to redo the profile then. Interesting. Both saying may not. I asked it not to do this. Some of the things I don't like about Windows is, doesn't matter what you tell it to do, it'll just do its own little thing in its own little corner and just make a goddamn mess of it all. I've just spent all morning sorting out uh, the overclocking on this machine. Uh, 
Yes, to all. Okay. Not looking too bad now. Here we go, Vulcan widget. Click a project. Does this compile? Success. Exit button didn't work very well, did it? Interestingly enough. Windows, what are you doing? Yep, yeah, everything works properly. Mind you, this is Windows 11, I guess, so. Or whatever it's called. Um, so I just put together a better window. That's basically all I did. How to get rid of all this rubbish? Mm -hmm. Alright, here we go. Here's the project. Let's go to the file system. It's easy to handle. So, what changes did we make? Um. Right, <clears throat> let's just run through the changes that were made at 3 o'clock in the morning. We are using uh, a UI. This, as you can see, there's a space left here. Uh, that's for our display layout. So this is display layout here. So I made a central widget with a vertical stacking layout and then put two horizontal layouts above each other the bottom one I'm using for the buttons and everything you see it's right here it's wrong here that's correct Hmm, oh, it's a different system here. That's interesting. I think this is a Windows 11 thing, so I'm going to ignore it. Simples. Alright, we'll put an autofill on it just in case that might be it. Mm, no, it does work though. Weird. <sighs> I don't know. Sort the colours out if you're on Windows, it's your choice. Um, pff, not really bothered right now. So that's the UI I'm using. In here, we just have the two things we set up and then we add our Vulcan widget into the display lay layout at the top the first position instead of the one which is below it or actually no that's to the right of it so that's the leftmost position on the top layout all right so delete UI anything else in here that's awkward no. Straightforward. Very simple. Oh, wait a minute. I spotted something there that shouldn't have been there. Don't need these. We can get rid of those. They are not needed. They are not in use. It should have said these are not being used. Alright, I'm happy with that. So 
So under graphics we have a Vulcan widget, which is literally it's just a widget. It um, sets itself off as a Vulcan widget from inheriting from the Vulcan window. Um, we have a rendering system. Um, we can get hold of our container, which is the actual Q widget that we need to fit the, the display. Um, there's a couple of signals here which Hmm. I don't know. I don't think we need them. So I can take those out. This is a second pass, by the way, where I'm trying to get rid of excess garbage. Uh, the rendering is pretty simple. This is the rendering system given by Vulcan. Here you go. Return new Vulcan rendering. So this is here. This is a standard QT Vulcan window renderer. <coughs> which they give you basically. Um, at the moment it's got some the device functions, uh, there's nothing on swap chains because we're not rendering anything. So start of a frame, I've given it really that should be brought back down now to a normal value. Um, That's wrong. That's just screen. Change the components on every invocation. This also helps verify the rate of which the thread is throttled to. Should be typically around 16 milliseconds. Note that rendering is two frames ahead. Well, yeah, I know that. Uh, who's doing this? Start next frame. By pre throttled by a presentation rate. Hmm. So basically, how does um, Vulcan work? You make a command buffer. Um, you add the render pass. with that command buffer into, well, begin um, using your device functions created here which basically is given to you by Qt that's a Q Vulkan device functions that gives you all your functionality a bit like OpenGL gives you all the different functions well, these ones are hidden more um, swap chain image size is the area of your screen. Pass RPG begin info gets passed in. This is the structure type. It's a default render path. And whatever the current frame buffer is, yeah. There's your swap chain image size for the Vulcan window. Yeah, we passed it in. Yeah, good. Um, area clear value count equals two because there are two buffers to be cleared no that's not right what's that clear value for oh 
Oh, that's the depth testing um, number, isn't it? Oh, that's not a QT thing. Where's that coming from? It's coming from there. Persistent resources, swap chains, yep, yep, yep. Mm hmm. So these are coming from VK. Interesting. Each clause's function must be followed by a call to uh, frame ready. Failing to do so will stall the rendering loop. Okay. Is your frame ready? Request update. So this is actual VK commands. Which I didn't even realise we were going to be using directly, but we are. Just out of interest. There's nothing coming up. We've got no IntelliSense. Ah, oh, here we go. Fence gets FD info KHR. Yeah, this is directly from the driver. Hmm, that's interesting. Okay, doesn't like the abbreviation. So we'd need a manual, which we've got. If I put in command over a C. Nothing. It's not picking up on much. Uh, VKC. Alright, so yeah, we've got everything. Wow, that's amazing. So it's all here, it's all in here. Um, so this Vulcan windowy thingy gives you all of the commands for rendering. That's nice. Awesome source. And that was it. That's what I did. I sorted out... Basically, I was more worried about this window here and how to use... or which command, should I say, to use here. And I came up with this is possibly the better of the commands. 
but otherwise that's what it was all about that's the central thing i wanted to get right all right is there anything else we can get rid of now mm. not overly bothered because most of the stuff is automated behind the scenes uh using oh that was the other thing we needed to get rid of this That's wrong. Right. Um, I think to make this into a full program, what we've got, remember, is this problem here. All of this is independent, and we've got this here, which just adds a VK widget to a UI, and we haven't even set up our own game loop. Which runs in parallel to this. Okay. I think that's what we should really do. Who's got a good game loop? Hmm. All right. Um, need a timer. Is that's the answer, basically. What's a good way of using a timer? Hmm. Now I know that the code that I want to use is actually in a Git repository on a server just by, by down by my right hand side. It's not something I want to be opening up right now because we're on Windows and we're playing around with Vulkan. If you're wondering, yes, I have uh, downloaded the SDK for Vulkan and followed all of the installation um, for that on Windows. It, I'm a bit tricky about this Windows 11 stuff because it is a pre-Windows 11. Remember, Windows 11 has not yet been fully released. This is the test. This is your beta test. God, Windows bringing out a beta. God, anybody would think they're a games company now. It's getting worse. The problem is, if you're going to program a game, you've got to program it for future proofing. You can't because Windows 10 will just be discontinued as soon as you don't care about it anymore. And that's as soon as they fix this system. Which doesn't work actually. Windows 11 doesn't work fully. It's fine. It just doesn't work as much as the other Windows didn't work. So there's no real difference. Oh, um. <clears throat> right, we just need a time. Where can I get a good timer from? Amber Skies. Yeah, we can get it from there. Mm -hmm. ba -da -ba -da -ba. Oh. You'll do. This is using Demon's Run. Um... I want Big Snake. The Big Snake project was probably one of the best, better ones. This is a full game, uh, written in Qt 3D, which I did four years ago. It uses the same concepts as this, Qt 3D and Vulkan. Qt 3D has now been expanded to include Vulkan, so we could just use that and ignore all of this programming.
<laughs> Irony. Every time QT3D is mentioned, though, on the internet, um, if you want to try and look it up, how to program it, good luck. It's all in QML. And I don't want QML. I want C++. Thank you very much. So, what do we got here? Let's have a look at... Just go back up again. Who are you calling? Haha, <laughs> Ghostbusters. Oh, I've left all my notes in. Oh, well done, me. We're using Window 3D for our UI layer. Well, I shouldn't be hard to find. There it is. That's interesting. Where's the timer? That's not right. I just get something wrong there in my head. Set background colour to black, yeah. Game. My game. Window. We pass the window into my... Yeah, just like we're doing with this widget, we're passing... It. Yeah, it's exactly the same as the main we've got now. My game is what we want. Called game. Here it is. We'll find our UI in here, won't we? We don't seem to set one up. We'll set up a screen, though. Yeah, we're using a queue timer. All right. We can do that. Why not? Interesting that I'm not using the other things here. I mean, this namespace UI, this is intrinsically why I'm designing this. Because I want a UI system. So this could be updated to... In Ooh, interesting. So we'll need a void go. May as well use the same words, because why not? So I'll take you one of you. Um, we'll need a private slot. Uh, slots. Okay, um, this is called what? Main game loop? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, it's a game programming club, so stuff it, we'll call it that. Not really too bothered what it's called. What we'll one of them. And to help out with all of this, we'll need a queue timer. So we'll take one of you. Why have I got queue size policy there? I'm not using a size policy in here at all. Okay. We'll pop in a timer. What should we call it? Hmm, that's an interesting one to call it. We'll 
pop that in here. Um, I'm not doing game logic right now. Or a start screen or anything like that. We've already looked into that on that, our first messing around. Hmm. Hopefully this should be a message for me. No, it's not. I'm waiting for a message from the bank. Uh, right, the timer can stay as a... Mm, I don't like it. Hmm. I th think it should be that. We shouldn't be really holding the timer on the stack, should we? Yeah, we should. I think we will. So, yes, the game states. Start up screen, playing, end screen. Pretty simple stuff there. Right, well our time is already fixed up because we haven't made it a pointer. So we just need to connect it. Let's connect it up. It's the last process we normally do here. But not quite. Because... I want this in here. I don't want it in the main for massive reasons. Okay, it's accepted the old format. Interesting. Uh, refactor that one, and we can refactor the main game loop as well. This is a standard way of dealing with the fact that it's an event-driven system. We create our own event, basically. Uh, so we are using a timed event. So if we have a look down at go, start screen equals a new start screen, get scene root, yeah, that's QT3D. Scene root, get scene root, and of course then we have this. So we have our timer, we start it here. And that'll pop us into here every 10 milliseconds. So that now becomes... Go. There we go. That's better. That explains itself a lot better. Okay, I'm happy with that. Back in here, we just have to do our main game loop, which is um, M underscore timer stop. 
you have to stop your timer otherwise it's going to overlap itself and of course we just have to repeat that at the end so we'll be back here in another 10 milliseconds or so there we go so we stop it we do our game loop and then at the bottom we'll just start it again here just using the same numbers we should really not have magic numbers in, but it's irrelevant, to be honest. Um, hmm. I wonder what would happen if... No, I can't do it from here. I can't use this timer to do the FPS. So we can show our game loop is running. Um, hmm. Just by creating a variable. Static. Um... I'll call it is running. This isn't part of the program. This is just a uh, bull, please. Is running, and um, we'll pop that equal to false. Okay. So here, if we are not running, put a capital R in. No. I'm getting back into camel case. I don't know why. So if it's false... Uh, we can... Q info and the info is main game loop you'll see why I'm doing it this way it's a game loop it's going to keep on going through this af you know time after time after time main game loop is now running. I only want it to do this once, which is why I put it inside an if statement with a bool protecting it. Is running uh, equals true. Alright, that, that just stops it repeating and repeating and repeating it and what? 100 times a second. And chucking out a load of Q info at me, which I don't really want. I just want to know that it's running. Well, it does something now, so we can check it, can't we? Uh, main game loop is now running. But something's changed. Oh, that's right. Yes, that's the right colour now, isn't it? Okay, something doesn't look quite right. But that's irrelevant. We are interrupting it. That's fine. Hmm. 
Hmm. We might be interrupting it too much. <laughs> Are we interrupting it too much? No, we're not. Good. Right. Fine. It is working. Lovely. So that's how you set up a main game loop. Uh, where you can do your logic, um, your game states, um, composing your frames, updating models, composing frames, uh, input for the key presses, and of course a warning if it goes out of bounds. So, yeah. So, zero. Input key pressed. Removes the start screen. And we'll then put the game state onto one, which immediately doesn't go here. Because that's an else. It then jumps out and goes back and comes back around and comes into here. Yeah, well, update model compose frame. And it will then start um, in QT3D. That's enough code to get things rocking and rolling, usually under compose frame, I think. But what we're looking at here is a... a, a Slightly different problem. You see, currently our renderer is calling itself. So our Vulcan window is calling itself. Now, if I take that out, it shouldn't work, correct? Yeah, it's gone totally black. Um, but I'm going to have to keep that blue in, aren't I? For now. Does it render itself once or not? Yes, it does. That's interesting. OpenGL does the same. Okay. So it's hard to tell. Uh, M Vulcan window is. doesn't like it. Because we don't store it. So really, we should have that, which we don't have. I want to put it after... well, it doesn't really matter where I put it. It should really go here. I 
bit like that. And that does mean that we can now set it. After the UI here. Uh, to VK widget. Like that. That'll do nicely. That sorts out the problem here. We now have it. How can we test it? Let's write a program to test it. I know what the answer to the program is, so that's good news. And we can write the program within this widget. Oh. Ah. That's create and that's a new one. Who's who's getting hold of this? Who's asking for it? To our instance. The system is asking for it. Right, so we have to do that differently. We can't do it with um, a return type of new. That's going to kill us. What is happening is our instance that we create is being passed through to the widget. This is then being used in our application exe to get hold of our rendering system via this. We can't have that. That will 100% kill us. So what we do need is a star m underscore renderer. Yeah. That needs to be set up when we enter. I don't know why I just did that. That was stupid of me. That's going to be... That line. So we only create it once, but now we can return it any time we want. That's better, because I want to access this now. Back in our window. I don't think that's right. <coughs> 
I think it should be... Oh god, what happened there? I think that should be get... Whatever it w said it was. Widget. It says create, but... We have to keep it, that's an override. We have to keep the naming convention. It's not our choice. For God's sake. Oh, so it won't do that. We were right in the first place. Fantastic. Right, I want to request... Make sure this still works, Kat, shall we? Main gay loop, yeah, okay, that's good. I think it's working. It looks like it is to me. So we can now request updates from within here. We don't need to though. We should. If we want control over the frame rate, we should. What's a good, easy way of timing it? I don't want a timer, I want time itself, don't I? So we need two variables. Um, we can just use queue time, I guess. Okay. to stop using camel case so we can have the current time how can we store it Come 
can we not get this more granular? Milliseconds. What does milliseconds give us then? Returns a milliseconds part zero to nine 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 of the time. All right, so it's going to reset itself. That's a bit of an awkward thing, isn't it? We're going to need a timer then, aren't we? <coughs> <coughs> use a timer. How do we start it? Hmm, good point. We'll come back to that in a second. Do I actually have to put anything in there? No, I don't. I could just start it and let it go. All right. I'll just let it go then. Um, and ba 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 d f p. S uh, plus plus <laughs> that's not right is it we need a counter FPS counter Something like that will do. Get the initial values. I'll use that one instead. Uh, 
Ba -da -ba -ba. If the timer I don't know how to use a timer. Great, that's great. What can we do with it? Is it interval? That's the time out. Oh, remaining time. Wait, does this thing count down? Returns to time's remaining value in milliseconds left until the time out. This counts down, doesn't it? Connected to his timeout signal, appropriate slots start from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could do it that way. Hmm, we can do it a simpler way though. We don't really need to put an event in. What does timeout return? What's its return value? Is it just true or false? Or what? It's just a call on timeout. All right, we'll do it that way then. <coughs> Why not? Uh, that's private. So we would need a int, some kind of int. Get FPS, something like that. And that just returns m under underscore fps. Nice and easy, nice and easy stuff today. I'm liking this. And um, use the same thing that we did in here. This could be interesting results. We'll need um, that's just one second. So every every second we are going to connect to something. All right, what we're going to connect to. Um, FPS. 
OBS update, maybe. Might be a good idea. Something like that. Private slots, yeah, got yeah. kind of things but hey ho so what happened to clear color why is this suddenly gone wonky I didn't touch this did I Oh, right. <clears throat> it's because we've got an error here. There you go. Sorted. Right, so our counter... It takes a second to update, though. That's fine. Uh, equals our M underscore FPS counter. We can again always, always, always. I found this in. Use one declared identifier. Oh! Are we not a Q object? exists okay it's probably not gonna like that because <sighs> we haven't got a mock connect 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 how does connect come into this play hmm He's fun to... Where does connect come from? I thought he came out of Q object. Yeah, it's Q meta object. So it does come out Q object. I've just put Q objects in. Hmm. 
No problem there. So why is that undefined? I know I haven't run it. Um, that's annoying. Fair enough. Can't do a connect. Undo. No queue object for us. Which means we can't have that. Back to the problem with queue timer again, aren't we? Milliseconds. Now we've got an int remaining time. The return value is false. If the timer is active, the return value will be minus one. Okay, we can use that then. If um, current timer dot remaining time is less than or equal to a one. then we can just call our function, can't we? FPS update, call, go, done. Sort it out, thank you, goodbye. Did we get past all the problems? Yes, we did. Fantastic. Well done, QT. All right. We do do a plus plus at that point, which is why I've got less than or equal to one and not using the zero. Because it can have a minus one on there as well. So if I put it equal to zero and there's a problem, we'll never know. All right, so first thing we do is we stop the damn thing. Always, always, always stop these things. All right, so that's that done. And then, of course, we can start it back up. Uh, for another thousand milliseconds. So the FPS um, counter gives us our FPS. Um, then we just have to return it to zero. Hmm. Yeah, that's correct. And it 
it can start adding it up again. And then all we have to is the get FPS, is that correct? Yeah, we have. And it's inside of our Vulcan rendering. Which we've already foreshadowed. Here. Uh, we can update any time wish. <clears throat> right, how does one of these thingies work? One of these thingies is called one of these. What's one of these? It's a QLCD number. There we go. It's got a paint event. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Segment. Current number of digits displayed. A decimal point. Display mode, segment styles, ah, uh, great. Value is a double. <laughs> Display int num. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll use that one then. Alright, I think we might be able to do it that way. Except I didn't look at what it was called. FPS di display. I've named it. Uh, UI. FPS display. Um... I guess that's display. Um, the M underscore vk widget no i don't really want the vk widget i want the other one mm, no i will have that one then uh we'll have to get Oh, it is, and it's create renderer. Which returns a value. Which we can then... Do nothing with. Damn you! Why can't I get it? <clears throat> 
that's the answer, but why can't I actually get hold of that? From the VK... No member named G... Get FPS. In where? In VK widget. A pass through? Is this create renderer really that bad? Could be. Let's have a look at it. Yeah, it doesn't exist in here. It's an override. Okay. We shouldn't be doing it this way. Ah, we can't do it another way because it's going to return a null pointer. Okay, fair enough. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. What we're really looking for then is just another one of these. Call to get renderer. Uh, that comes back as a Q Vulcan window renderer. Ah. Hold dear horses, we've got the wrong thing here. Hmm. Yeah, we have. God, you got to be so damn careful with these things. I want that.
Vulcan rendering this. Is that what I originally had? It's a new Vulcan rendering, this. Yeah. That's okay. Hmm. Why can't I? Because I've got it as that. Okay. We change that over to there, and you're fine. Just the wrong type on it. That's why it couldn't find it on that one. Hmm. Not enjoying this inheritance garbage. I don't like inheritance at the best of times, but with QT it's designed to use inheritance. So it should work. Alright. So I won't get There we go. Okay. That's uh hundred and eleven sixty. It's working. So the first flash of 111 is actually not an error. That is correct. Because it takes time for our system to start up. And once our system's starting up, frames are being generated and pumped out by the graphics card. Just because we're not actually interfering with it at that stage means that it's left to its own devices, literally. There you go, 60 FPS. Fantastic. That's the answer I was after. It's working. That's how you get FPS, by the way. Can we clean this rubbish up? No, we know it works. Um... that anymore. Alright, let's get rid of you. Let's pop you in there. Um, Okay. That's you complete. Yeah, we don't need you anymore. But thank you for letting us do that. Okay, any...
anything in here? No. Okay, we're keeping things down. No, we don't need that line. Let's get rid of it. Okay. That should be a zero. Everything else is okay. Current time start. Yeah, I'm happy with that. So we only needed three, but, hmm, yeah, well, there is that, I guess. Otherwise, we're okay in here. Nothing else is messed up. That's kept simple. We've now got this ability to actually get the correct thing, that instead of that. Inheritance works perfectly for both. Um, these signals, ditch. I haven't thought of a reason why we need them. And I think that's a compile. Fifty six, sixty. That's better. Now it's working better. Yeah, as soon as we move the window around, oh, we're getting spurious. Okay, does the mouse point to it? Mm, we are getting that high, like, catch, catch me up type thing going. And it's still updating, so it's running when it's not being shown. Hmm. When it's not focused. Okay. That's fine, I suppose. Works. <coughs> So we're still in pass two. Well, pass one to pass two, aren't we? Hmm. We'll do a commit. So, FPS counter complete um, everything else works code is now ready for development I'll call it scene development. I'm more than happy with that. How do I get this up onto tools? Uh, remote push. Oh, I don't know what it is. 
this either. Oh, it did it. So that works. Let's have a look on the dev branch. We should now be able to see in a Vulcan widget. Yeah, we can see that that's changed properly. The only thing I don't like about this is that I'm using Qt Creator. The problem here is that Qt Creator is so helpful, but it looks so crap. Ah, it's a shame. When the output of GitHub looks better than the output on your uh, editor, you know there's something not quite right. Lovely. Except, um, bleh. I don't know. Oh well. I can read this better than I can read this. Mind you, I'm not supposed... This is at 180%, I guess. So, really, that's how it should look to me. Which is a lot better. Obviously. But as we are on uh, Twitch, you wouldn't mind being able to read it, would you? Um... All right, I'll go with that. What was that? Updated. Yeah, that's better. There you go. That is on Windows. We started this on Linux. We finished it on Windows. Wow. Well, we were clever ones today. So is there anything anybody else wants before I go off on probably one of my random thingies? Do I want to use Vulkan? Do I want to use Qt3D? It's exactly the same code. You just change a few bits and pieces on the wording. Basically. It's the same system. It's just that Qt3D has... no VK in it, um, it just uses uh, functions generated specifically for Qt3D. One of the reasons I am thinking of using it is because they introduced an animation system and let's take a look at this in a second. What's it just doing this? They've done something else. They have put some updates through which I never thought they would do. 
I never even thought to put animation in. But they have. It's an incomplete system still. But saying that, it's got its own ECS. Um, you don't have to have your own ECS system to run it. Which is... Mm, is that an advantage or a disadvantage? I like my ECS system. It's very easy to use. Theirs isn't. Have I got a component of the ECS in here? Where's that bloody thing gone? Whoops. I do hate computers. Hmm. We were in Demon... No, not Demon's Run. We were in the Big Snake. Um... Model Loader, okay. Yeah, I put an, I, I actually made an FPS component. To work with in QT 3D. Can you see the problem? Because you don't just have to make the component. You also have to do all the back end and functionality of that component. The system, for instance, of how it should be used by Q application. So it do a simple FPS example of a component for QT 3D. One, two, three, well, one, two, three, four, five, five files. Not a good result for me, that one. That That's what stopped me using QT 3D. And I went on to open, uh, Q Open GL instead to learn differently. Now, I don't know how easy Vulcan animation is. I know how to do it. You use keyframes. Hmm. See, it's called a quick animation here. So you'd use keyframes. Key I'm in the wrong place.
Here we go. You've got a back end, you've got a front end, um, you've got your animation. So this is the full animation system. Here it is. There you go. <clears throat> so it looks as though it's um, header. So this gives us constant interpolation, linear interpolation, and Bezier interpolation. Uh, Bezier means it's an S curve, linear means it's a straight line and constant means it's uh, time dependence, delta time. So you put in your key frames, the coordinates, the coordinate you're going from and to, and the interpolation time. And that's for each thing or each coordinate of a model that you wish to animate. Interestingly it's in fact 2Ds. I wonder if they're not bothering with the Y component. Ah, 3D animation, yeah, keyframe, yeah. Yeah, it looks straightforward. So we don't need QT 3D for animation, we can probably do it ourselves. That's not going to be a problem, I don't think. I can generate keyframes from OBJ files. They can be loaded up direct. If we think about it, 3D is pretty easy. Um, kettle's on. 
We have Vulcan for rendering. Asimp, the asset import library for loading up models if we want it. Qt3D uses Asimp as well, so it's not that bad. Um, Asimp doesn't come with with uh, Qt. It would have to be installed separately on Windows. That could be fun. Um, don't know how Qt Creator would react to it. I've never tried it with Qt Creator. We could just download binaries and cheat. Hmm, yeah, there is that. Asimp comes as integrated into the operating system for Linux, so there's no problem on Linux. We could probably develop the code there and use the downloaded binaries. That would be the best way to go for that. Um, animation, keyframes and stuff like that. It'll take a bit of doing, but can be done. It's not difficult. Vulcan's fast, it's independent and is running in parallel with our program. All we have to do is load stuff up, put it into Vulcan and let it go. Let it do its own thing. <laughs> Adding keyboard and mouse input. And there you have everything that you need for a 3D game anyway. After that it's collision and mouse picking. Mouse picking is what I was going to talk about today. That was today's talk, wasn't it? I remember. I remember. Let me go and make this cup of coffee. really sure I should break the industry uh, rules and uh, tell you how it's done. Should do really. I can tell you how it's done on research from the internet. That's a joke. What we got on our research board? 
Uh, we've got AI still um, to look at. We could do that instead. I'm actually starting to think about writing some of the logic behind this. But there's a few complicated issues that come out of it. Um, so we might not do that straight away. Was I in util dev? Oh yes, we're doing it's because it's an extension of this rule of three thing that I was talking about the other day. Um, with the dice on how it goes from a straight line to um, a lump line. <laughs> what the hell do you call that? Um, yeah, one of them lines over here. So how you go from uh, the RNG gods in a straight line to... Um, this bell curve, I think they call it. I don't like naming things, really. Because I change them. So that's what this was all about over here, how to work out to do non-comparative results and it comes up that this is the beginning of AI because what's happening is you're starting off with a straight line and you're heading into a bell curve so the choice that you make is usually at the top of the bell curve for a correct decision the information you gather, the more information you gather about a subject, the more correct you will be at the outcome. Theoretically. But we humans know that's not true. Absolutely not true. Otherwise we'd be right all the time, wouldn't we? And we are far from that. And that's why the rule of three is used, because there is that hidden fourth. Zero. Um, I could go into that area. I mean, these are topics that I am thinking of doing. Um... Why doesn't it tell me which canvas I'm on? Oh, it does. Util. Dev. Okay. I don't really want to put it in here. Hmm. Okay. All right. Thoughts. <coughs> what do we want to do next? We have currently got uh, Twitch. We currently have um, the beginnings of a static library. We have utility development complete on items, I believe. Yeah, an item warehouse. Uh, we have the Vulcan widget project, which I am not moving into uh, the static library. At this point, anyway. Which is now in a state that can, could be used for 3D graphics. is working properly I think easy to tell yeah it's working properly it's just slightly blue 
That's good. All right, we've got an FPS counter going on and we have a button that works. Yeah, it, this is in a state now of... It's not golden, but it's equivalent to a pass two. There's a few things in here which I do disagree with, but that's beside the point. Yeah, we're okay. We are okay with this now. I was a bit worried about that line there. That's worked out okay. So far. I don't know if that is 100% true. Um, main's okay. The widget's okay and the rendering is fantastic. Um, and very simplistic. Well, even though that we haven't filled it in. Because this is where all the rendering stuff goes. Um, this is just start next frame. We've got all this stuff here. And bits and pieces to do. I don't really want to do Vulcan rendering unless people want it. I mean, it's quite, it's pretty, pretty up in depth. And as a starter piece, I think this is okay for people to get started with it. Yeah, I think we're okay. I did read through the manual for Vulcan. Um, well, Windows read through it for me. I just listened. I think we're going to be okay now with Vulcan. It was the entry point that I was worried about more than Vulcan itself. Vulcan itself is damn simple when... I'm not going to say that you understand it, but when you compare it, compare its power to that of OpenGL, where OpenGL, you have to come, come up with some very creative answers to get certain things done. Vulcan, you don't need to. With uh, OpenGL, you have to compose your scene, load it up to the graphics card, render it. With Vulkan, you set up a pipeline and stream it. That's the big difference. And that's why Vulkan is probably going to be the future of 3D. And replace OpenGL in... If Vulkan can get to version 3, possibly version 3.3, .3, at that point it will replace OpenGL. At the moment it's at 1.3, it's still in its infancy, and it's got growing pains. Which is fine, it just makes it a little trickier to use in certain places. But it's nothing you can't cope with. I mean, it's only like using OpenGL 1.3. Go ahead, download it, try using it. You will be tearing your hair out. This is beautiful compared to that. This is a work of beauty. QT takes a lot of the complexity away and does it for you. So as QT updates alongside Vulkan over the next few years, so we'll be looking at QT, what, 9? 8? We're on 6.2 at the moment. So around about QT, 9. If QT 3D survives and is not completely replaced by Vulkan at that stage, um, QT 3D will be supporting Vulkan as its main rendering source, I would think. It's already supporting um, uh, Vulkan as of now, as of 6.2. QT 6.2. QT 3D supports Vulkan as a back end. But you do have to set it. <coughs> uh, 
Um, what are people looking for? I think that's one of my next, it's not a complaint, it's a bit of a bugbear, is, is mouse picking. When you click on the screen, how do you know what you're clicking on? It's a 3D world. And um, let's have a look at that in simplistic terms. Okay. And I, you'll you'll obviously see the big problem with this. Let's go to research. Let's go to the research board. Okay. Um AI Hmm. We'll go over here somewhere. Yeah, this will do. Can we go to two six seven? About two six five that'll do. So if we pop research off there, we can use this part of the board here. It's a nice big blackboard, isn't it? It's infinite, by the way. Well, it's as big as your hard drive. I wasn't really planning on making this talk today. I was going to go possibly do a bit more on the AI, but um, this is in my thoughts at the moment because there's... A solution to it which I haven't written yet <laughs> it's again something I haven't written a bit like the AI that's gonna be interesting so what we're gonna do <coughs> is just take a little look at what the idea is you first uh, you first got to have some kind of concept of what mouse picking is and how if you research on the internet you're going to come up with a completely different answer to what the industry actually uses so so be be aware of that. That's the first thing. Uh, so, uh, three D. I'm going to call it graphics because we might change our mind from Vulcan. But the concept and everything is still the same. Three D graphics. Um, and we'll call it mouse picking because that's what they do. That's that's what they call it. Um, which is in my vocabulary. targeting an object yeah mouse click mm, don't really need it Can be a left, right, middle, whatever, button click. But I'm doing it now by drawing on the on this blackboard. We are mouse picking. If I change this over to an eraser, I can then erase that area there. Now this is 2D. But it's still the same concept. So 2D 
3D, 1D, 2D, 3D, even 4D is all the same concept. And don't be afraid to go into 4D, please. It's brilliant. It's a lot more fun than 3D. That's one of the problems with the rule of three. Yeah, there's a fourth dimension. Um, right, so we've got this mouse picking. How, how, if you research this on the internet, theor, how is it done theoretically? So let's do Well, I don't know how many L's there are, so we'll have that many. I can choose one, I can choose two. It's English. Who cares? What you do is you have a mouse on a screen. As you can see. So let's draw our monitor. We'll draw it as uh, three in three, well, three D-ish. Uh, so there we go. One monitor. Okay, it's got a little base. And it probably has legs or something. There's your monitor. And you will have a mouse pointer on that monitor. So you got your mouse pointer. Yeah. Which you can move around. Um, so this is your monitor. Monitor display. of a 3D scene, a 3D scene. So we're going to have to just extend that back a bit, aren't we? Because your monitor is going to go like this and this and this this as mm, that's not really going to work out very well mm. not as a graphic anyway Let's do it that way. Okay. Um, we'll put hills. Um, well, stream something. And we'll put a tree in. There we go, one tree. And we'll put another tree in here. And our little bloke. He's having a wonderful time. 
uh, running around the world. We're using our mouse pointer to guide him. Um, and he goes up to a tree with an axe and chops at it. How do we know which tree it is? Which model? Well, we have a mouse pointer. Let's pretend it's this tree here. Let's try to cut a tree down. The question is, which tree model? And this is called mouse picking. And that's your premise. <clears throat> In theory, Because obviously if you're going to cut the tree down, you know, you need to know which tree model it is so you can affect that tree model and replace it, if need be, with another tree model that looks like a tree cut down. Or make the tree fall over with an animation. You, you, you will have to do something or turn it into a tree stump. You should do something graphically to represent the fact that the tree gets cut down. Otherwise, what are you programming? You may as well just be doing manga art or something at that point. God knows. Or cartoons. Too, even, you go 2D if you're not doing this. Mind you, if, you t if you're in 2D, you've still got to do this anyway. If you research this on the internet, what they will ask you to do is not spell it like that. Imagine firing a beam of light from the 2D mouse position into the 3D scene to determine what it hits. Hits and selects. That's how you do it. According to the internet. Hmm. And then it'll go into all the equations of how to do it. It'll show the beam of light, how you've got to go along the beam of light. You've got to halve the beam of light and until you reach, like, is is the object, uh, is there an object within the beam of light that, you know, that 
the be this this beam of light will hit first. If there's an object within that beam, then you halve and you do it again, and they keep halving it down until you have found that there's only one object left within your beam of light. When that there is only one object left within your beam of light, that is the object you have selected. Okay. So it's a recursive chopping in half of a beam of light finding how many objects intersect that beam of light. Got it? Until you finally have the closest object to the screen. That is how they would like you to do it. If you're a games programmer and you are working for EA, for instance, which I would never advise you to do because they are a bunch of people. Yes, I'm being polite today. You would take the frame buffer on the screen. Remember, this is just a frame buffer. And you've just drawn it all with a depth buffer on your GPU. Your GPU already knows what is closest to your mouse. It has a depth result. You query your depth buffer and frame buffer for that position or pixel on the screen and that will tell you which model it is. Which is faster, do you think? To query something that's already been calculated, even though it's only going to be shown for 16 milliseconds on your screen at 60 FPS, or calculate a beam of light and start halving it recursively over and over and over again until you find the only object left on that beam of on that length of light yeah i can tell you which one's the fastest i think it's referencing the buffers and this is where vulcan comes in because i said we're streaming and it's got three buffers so we have that frame buffer for 32 milliseconds even though a new frame buffer is being placed on the screen, you still have access to the previous frame buffer because you're drawing to an, a new cleaned one. And this is why we uh, programs might use triple buffering. You've got the data already. You don't need to create any more. So... If you do look this up on the internet and you come across a, a beautiful piece of work on how to do mouse picking by firing um, a beam of light into the scene and then halving that beam of light until you can find the closest object on that beam of light. If you want to do it that way, good luck. I'm more interested in that frame buffer. <laughs> we have drawn the scene. We have depth tested the scene. We know what's closest already. Why not use that information? We have access to that frame buffer. We must have access to it because we put it on the... Uh, well, we didn't put it on the GPU. The GPU put the information into a frame buffer. That's a better way of putting it. So whilst it's doing that, why can't it, you know, send a frame buffer our way? 
hint hint a copy of it maybe a copy of that data because uh, we don't really want it on the GPU we want it ourselves maybe we should have two outputs from our shaders or and go between output from our shaders which we can look at I think a go between would probably be better there's no point in copying it because it could be a lot of data it is on this screen anyway because this is a 4k screen so that's a lot of pixels with RGB uh, alpha values so for each pixel there's five, there are at least four values all you need to know is uh, Who's, who does that value belong to? And your shader can tell you that. Your graphics card can tell you that, should I say. So that's where you should be thinking of looking. Not at firing laser beams at trees. But instead, thinking about pos the possibilities of we've got a graphics card. It's going to present onto the screen this frame buffer. It came about this frame buffer somehow. We need to access that information. So for me, our GPU As a runner shader, shader is just a program that you create that runs on your graphics card. So the GPU is run a shader to create. Um, the output to the display which includes using a depth buffer um, yeah I mean, how, you, you need to understand how depth buffers work we can talk about that if you wish Why not ask GPU to tell us what the mouse currently hovers over not selected but currently hovers over if it's clicked well then whatever it's hovering over has been selected so why not ask the GPU to tell us what the mouse currently hovers over from 
from all this data. it has produced. Why recreate that data ourselves? That makes more sense to me. And that's my answer. If you're going to research mouse picking Research number two, you might not get very far on it. You may come back to me with a lot of questions. But please, please, please don't fall into the trap of creating a load of data for yourself using a recursive function. Because recursive functions can go disastrously wrong and cause ickle lags in the middle of combat when you need to know what you've just hit. And this is why in combats you'll find they use uh, tab targeting, I think they call it within the games, <coughs> where you click on the opponent or you tab to target your opponent and that opponent is then well, the system then concludes that if you hit, that is the target that you hit. Simple. It checks the distance, makes sure you can hit it. You then, if you can hit it, you take a swing, it will check to see if you do hit it. With this, you don't need to do that. You don't need a targeting system. You can just swing your sword. The length of your sword should be known. You can then look at that point in the depth buffer in front of your character or where the sword is being swung. You could even probably do it circular in 3D, glo in, in like a globe, a, glo a globe or glob of data. And from that data depending on whether you swing your sword from the right or from the left, you can find out what the first thing you hit is. It's probably very easy to do, because if you're trying to do an animation, you can use the animation data to find out what the first thing you hit is. When does it intersect with another object? When does it stop rendering the sword? and start rendering this other object. Well, your sword can't pass behind something, so it's obviously hit something. Whether it's a wall, a floor, a ceiling, a door, uh, an opponent, whatever, it's hit something, your sword shouldn't carry on swinging. But on the tab system it does. Which is why you'll see on maps, there's usually a lot of clutter around the walls or outsides of maps to stop you from moving there so that when you do a swing of a sword the animation doesn't clip through the wall because they're not checking for it. And when it, they can't even be bothered doing that then it just completely destroys the illusion of 3D the immersiveness of the game and you will find things clipping all over the place and just not looking right. <laughs> You're gonna, you, if you go by the first idea, you are diving into programmer's hell. If you go by the second one and you can pinpoint the precise point at which the data that you need is actually available and ask for it, you've gone to programmer's heaven. So don't start um, shooting light beams at your screen, please, peeps. Just ease off on that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Think about it. <clears throat> a 
So good games, AAA games that are worth the salt and don't use tab targeting, as I'm going to call it, use two. Those ones that are in hell um, is 95% of them, but hey-ho, that's not my problem. They obviously can't think. And that's one of the problems with inexperienced programmers these days is um, if you think that the number of programmers is doubling every five years, then the average experience of all programmers in this kind of area is less than 50% less than five years over 50% of people who are programmers today have less than five years experience in doing this kind of thing so they'll look it up and they'll go to Google and it'll say fire your light beam through the screen here are the equations And they'll go, oh goody, we've got a solution, let's write it. Why am I mentioning this now? Because we haven't actually drawn anything on our screen. That's why I'm mentioning it now. To make option two viable, all of those ideas of buffers and shaders that you are used to change instantly. A buffer can no longer be vertex data texture data color data material data whatever you want to call it a buffer has to be not just a model going through the system being drawn into the scene the buffer has to be the whole scene everything as much as is goddamn well possible otherwise you are going to have to reference that data continuously as it's produced if you place every single one of your models into your scene individually then until that last model gets placed in you won't know the answer if you can group massive amounts of models into a single buffer, you can probably get away with two or three buffers. One, they will certainly, and without any doubt whatsoever, render faster. Uh, by a thousand times but that's a side effect and possibly something you m might enjoy as a byproduct and that's true actually you can get up to I think currently well over 500 thousand models created into a scene without having um, one big model to cover, like the landmass or whatever. That's actually quite easy to do. On this GPU that I've got here, I think we could easily break the billion. I think we could double it. Easily. And have very complex landscapes. You'd use tiling, obviously.
instead of just making one big model of the landscape and then dumping that through the uh, GPU. Which is why a lot of these games have fixed landscapes. Um, because they can't alter them. They are literally drawn in Blender as a 3D model and then dumped through the GPU. Yeah. Or a section of that model is dumped through the GPU, should I say. That's a lot of vertices. So if you use tiling and you use um, buffers which contain multiple models, we're talking thousands of models per buffer, you can at any time take one of those models out and replace it with another one. And that's when you have something called a dynamic world. A world which can change permanently. That's a byproduct of doing idea two. Does that excite people? What you are creating now is a virtual reality, which you can interact with in totality, down to one meter cubed anyway, De or depending on how far down into it you want to go. If you are inside of a room, um, which is 10 meters by 10 meters, you might be able to go down to the centimeter quite happily. You could actually go down to that level of detail for interaction. On uh, an RPG scale, we'll call it one meter cubed. Is if you want a big world. I think that's only fair. So what it comes down to is granularity. Um, how big a cube can you interact with at any one time? Minecraft did this successfully uh, by inventing the Vauxhall engine. Um, well done to them. Absolutely, hands off. They got the basic idea and turned it into something called the Vauxhall, Vo Vauxhall engine which relies on cubism, I suppose. It's a form of art and form of graphics. It makes 3D quite easy. It's low polygon. Um, what is it, 12? Yeah. 12 polygons per cube, isn't it? Which means that it is 1236 vertices per cube. You cannot join vertices together in 3D because then your shading doesn't work. So don't do that. Don't be tempted to do that. Don't be lazy. You get um, your lighting effects just won't work. 36 vertices going through... Um, a, G, a modern GPU, even an old GPU, going back as far as something like the RX 480, is fast, very fast. In fact, you probably don't even need a GPU. You could just put it through your CPU and it wouldn't matter these days. It used to matter because your CPU used to be slow. So you needed a GPU to make 3D. But the first games that were produced weren't produced on 3D cards. Elite was a universe which you could fly through. Okay, so the polygons weren't filled in until 64-bit um, with the Commodore 64. They filled in the polygons at that point with colours. But when it originally came out, it was wireframe. 
but it ran at 40 frames per second without slowdown. Okay, it was a space sim, and there wasn't all the big problems um, to cope with that you might have on a planet, for instance. But you still have those problems of regulating your frames per second. And the whole thing was done in 32K. It was actually less than 32K. I think the original leak came out in 16K. If you were to program that on a modern machine, it's about 130 some... No, it's 168K. Because of all the stupid garbage there is now on operating systems. that you have to jump through all the hoops for. Interestingly though, that was done in assembler code. I haven't visited assembler code yet with you lot, have I? Not properly anyway. Thoughts, though. Big thoughts. I'm at, only at 3.32 on my clock here. Hmm. I haven't written the code for two. I've written the code for one. Because I used to be naive years and years ago. Now I'm not stupid. Now I sit down and think about things before I do it. I prefer to think for a week and do something properly uh, rather than hop onto Google and find out what the stupid inexperienced people are going to tell you to do. If you do hop onto Google you will not come up with today's solution. Which is that three lines well you won't come up with that solution the one line of code that makes it work remember I was struggling with it and I didn't like what I was doing and then I didn't I was umming and ahhing and oh I was having a nightmare with myself about that one line of code now you know why because that one line of code mattered so much it's the key it's the whole UI because there's things you can do in QT that people haven't explained to other people. See this button here? I can set it so I can pick it up and put it in here. I could put a little tab here, click on it and a drawer would open with icons in which I could then probably pull down into let's say a rack of squares at the bottom maybe there's ten of them one for each of the one to zero numbers across the top of your keyboard hmm which you could use for skills maybe you can do that in QT That's what I was thinking of when I was doing this line of code. Not whether my UI looked nice or not. I don't care. I want the ability to pick up a widget and move it anywhere on the screen that I so choose. And to do that is quite easy really these days you overlay a widget with with a background that has an alpha value of zero a see-through widget and on that widget you can place your 
other widgets, your buttons, that you can click on. And you can detect that you click on them using the Qt engine. So that's something to think about for you UI programmers out there. So if it's that easy to do it with the UI, it should be that easy to do it because it's exactly the same idea. You create a widget which covers your original screen. That widget is a buffer which you can then move other widgets around inside. The background on... No, you don't even need the background doing, do you? Oof. That's fantastic. The reason you can do all of this is because these are parents. Um, I'll show you what I mean. It has a parent-child structure. Uh, widget, that'll do. If I hit F1 on that, and you go down to the constructor, Q widget parent. So any Q widget can be the child or have a parent of another widget. In other words, it can be inside of that widget. It can also have its own window flags, but who cares about that? That's the bit there that makes it all possible. Oh, that was an interesting way of doing things. That Q widget there. That parent. There. That's the thing that matters. The whole of QT is structured upon a parent-child relationship. The topmost widget has a parent of null pointer, which tells the system, the Q application, that that is the base. That is your screen. And that's what that UI thing does. Because you might notice we don't actually give it a parent. There's no parent. We just pass in our widget to be used. We don't give a parent, so it's automatically taken as uh, a null pointer into a Q main window. Press F1. Look at the constructor. Oh look, Q widget star parent equals null pointer. So we don't need to give it. It's automatically going to be assigned as a null pointer. The window flags equals QT window flags. We don't care about them, so that's going to be whatever that value is. We could set them, but we're not doing it at the moment. Well, we are. We are setting them in uh, UI here. That's what this little dot UI thing does. Um, so what we have done is, if you have a look at the idea now, is we have the parent, we set up the data of the parent, with for our widgets that we put on the form in the window.ui and then we are adding our own output display widget here with the insert widget into the display layout which we create. That is then held in here with that as the parent that has a parent of the central widget. The central widget has the parent of the Rana window. The Rana window has the parent of a null pointer. It forms a tree. This horizontal layout, the one that's at the bottom that I'm just using as um, 
information and a button has one, two, three, four children. I need the horizontal spacer. Why? Because if we don't have the horizontal spacer, that space from left to right there wouldn't happen. That spacer expands and pushes the exit button to the bottom right and pushes your FPS and that to the bottom left. I can put something dead center. Watch. This is remarkable. This is why I like using this. If I get a button, say this button, our test button, and I put it there, and then I get another horizontal spacer, and I put it there, when I run this, watch what happens to this push button. It goes dead center. Ish. And if I do that, it remains dead center. Because it's now got expanding thingies on either side of it, keeping it there. And that is done by the UI system for you. Interesting, huh? How you can play with this once you've got the setup. To get that central widget to work, though, was the tricky bit. What you do is you get your, but your first button, you just plonk it anywhere on the screen, and then you click on this layout vertical thing here, and everything goes weird, but it sets it up. You then have to place um, a horizontal layout one above and one below the button and then move the button into the bottom one by doing that and just dropping it in there and of course I've also added it here so I didn't have to put it into the program so it's done for me <coughs> If you're interested, there are quite a few different given slots for these widgets. Uh, there's hide, lower, raise. Raise means if there's two overlapping widgets, you can raise one above the other. Lower, you can lower it down behind another one. You can hide it completely. You can have an update run. That's an interesting idea. That kind of thing can be used for opening, adding widgets, um, opening more windows, that kind of thing. It's got to delete, delete later. Is that the only choices it's got on here? Yeah. But there's a lot more than that. You can repaint it so you can change the background. Yeah, these have backgrounds, by the way. All of these widgets here. And I think QH box layout is a widget as well. Is it a container? Mm, no, it just says layout, so it might not be. That just holds the positions for everything. Very good system. I like it. It's one that I agree with, because it's simple to use, complex to master. And it also means I have to sit down and think sometimes for 24 hours before I come up with a final line of code. 
because there are so many different variations on what you can do and the different types of effects that that code will have on the rest of your program. We haven't spoken about that, have we? What do I mean by gold code? What is pass three? Why is it gold code? Hmm. For that, you need to learn a bit more about functional uh, languages, and C plus plus is a functional language, as you can see. As you can see. Interesting stuff, interesting things to think about. People also ask me, why do I not use QTest? Um, because I test my code as I go. And then if I get an un expected result in further coding I go back and retest it all I prefer to waste the time um, rather than hit a test button that says everything's okay and you still got this unexpected result happening and you've got no idea why That's called um, falling through the floor. <laughs> How many RPGs have that one, I wonder? I think most of them suffered from that. I'll show you how to get around that, actually. <coughs> How you can make it impossible if you write your physics correctly um, with gold code and you create your model correctly for the floor, you can't fall through it. It's an impossibility. Unless you've got a shovel and you can dig through that model. I think we're okay on that. So that's our little chat about... Um, what were we chatting about? Mouse picking, yes. That's what it's all about. <coughs> so that's my answer. Uh, there is a third answer. I will leave that to your choices. And of course, there is the answer that nobody will ever, ever come up with. I don't think in my lifetime anyway. Unless I do. I'm thinking about it. There is the null option. <coughs> the one that doesn't exist. These first two definitely exist. The third one, you're going to have to think hard about. And what I want to tell you, if you do want to think about the third one, is, hey, guys, it's a flat screen, it's 2D, and all this 3D stuff's an illusion. Yeah. So why treat it as 3D? Anyway. <coughs> it's a picture. Alright, so we're doing okay with research now. My god, research suddenly took off. Um, I do want to think about this more. And I know I do. Close it before you do. Jesus. What do you want next, peeps? What do you want next? Is there any projects that people are doing that they want... Um, 
ideas for? Because remember, if you ask me a question, you'll get more than one answer. And I won't say one is better than the other. I'll point out um, possible benefits of doing one over the other. But with you've got to remember that when you have benefits, you also have nastiness as well, usually. So we've done some utility development. Uh, we've got our dice sorted. We don't have our, I well, we do have items sorted, but we haven't got the systems for using those items sorted because I wanted to go over mouse picking first. And to go over mouse picking, I had to get a graphics system. Um, we chose Vulcan, just <laughs> really at random. Or possibly because it's the future, I don't know. I'm not sure why I chose Vulcan. Maybe it's because I've never written the full system. I wouldn't mind doing that. Uh, Midnight is usable already. Um, the usable code is available on the master, not the dev branch. might go back to this now that we've talked about it. At the moment, we've just got this initializer. And that's it. Which we're just going to literally throw in the bin. So we've got these two functions here. This is what stops me from doing pass two. I can't do pass two because pass one hasn't even been done. Um, and it's line 21 uh, that you would do next. <clears throat> Generating items on the flight. Now you understand that however you go about designing your graphics system for your game, you're going to have to rethink it. Because what you originally thought ain't going to work now. We're about to generate items on the fly. How the hell can we generate these huge massive buffers on the fly? How can we generate, how can we write shaders that are going to accept this kind of thing? Are they going to be too generic? No, they don't have to be generic at all. But people may think that. Lighting's not a problem. Cameras are not a problem. You see, once we get that piece of code, we also have generating the map on the fly. How do we want to generate the map? How can we put an item into the world? Because there's no zero. There's no foundation there's no there's this little empty spot that isn't in your world and that's where your items are going to be generated on the fly it's going to be in the rule of three it's going to be in that null spot in the middle of that node we could use the qt parent child system and I think that's probably the route down which we will go. Because QT is designed that way. 
with C++ you would have to design your code along those lines if you want if you weren't going to use Qt that can avoid um, items going down black holes which if they do you've got a memory leak If you are going to generate items on the fly within the rule of three system, they have to have a parent, even if it's the world itself. They have to belong to something. A tree belongs to the world or a map or whatever you want to call it. A scene. We'll call it a scene. Yeah, there we go. We called it a scene. That was a bit of foreshadowing, wasn't it? I'm more confident now that we can generate gold code for that. Whereas when I wrote that line, I wasn't sure. I was seeing that black hole. But now we've worked through a bit of research and we've understood the principles behind this mysterious rule of three, which you'll never understand. Well, I hope you won't anyway. I understand it perfectly and I'm confused by it. Hopefully we'll be able to extend on that and uh, use it to our advantage. And it's going to be a biggie, because nobody in the gaming world is using that, not even for um, 2D platform jump jumpers kind of thing. They're just not using it. And because they're not using it, they are having bugs in their programs, which are, well, they're programming them in. The operating systems aren't helping either. If I get this right, we will be protecting ourselves from the operating system. Because instead of using the operating system, we are going to create an overlay. So that the operating system resides below our um, own operating system. If that makes sense. We are literally going to be building our own games operating system on top of whatever Linux window or Mac or God knows what system you're running on your computer. It won't matter. It just won't matter. And that's one of the reasons I chose Qt, I think. Because this has the embedded Q app which will give us that. Uh, without having to write it ourselves. I think that's cool. So, how did the temperatures go? 36 to 39 degrees C on the graphics card. Our CPU frequency is at 1 gigahertz, and our CPU is at 33 degrees C, we're at 17 degrees in the room. I'm happy with that result, and uh, the fans didn't ramp up, they have been at a stable 1114 RPM, good. Hmm. I'm just going to let it run. It's at 60 frames per second. I think we'd have to put shaders in. But yeah, it does go up. Mm, maybe not. 
So we're running around 40 degrees C for the base and that's what I wanted. I wanted under 40 and I think we've got it. CPU did manage to get to 0.9 gigahertz to be able to keep up with this program. <laughs> we don't need these chips Intel. They should take a book, uh, a page out of the book of AMD. Like this is an AMD processor. Yeah. Uh, tools. Good. Done. I'm happy with that. Are you happy with that? It's four o'clock. I'm signing off. Thanks, peeps, for people who have uh, stopped by. Um, we, I'm on an interesting journey for me because now... I'm literally heading into retirement. I can sit down and do this. This is what I've wanted to do all my life, uh, is sit down and take all the information that I've been absorbing over my life and work through it. All of that time, all of those systems, all of that code. Finally, I get to throw away all the crap. And on that note, I'm going to love you and leave you and allow you to have some fun yourself. Go on, go have some fun, peeps. How do I switch this off now? I uh, don't know. Maybe we go to live stream and stop streaming. Catch you later.